My name is Sandro Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to this public health conversation. These events are meant as spaces where we engage with issues of consequence for health. Guided by expert speakers, we come together to discuss, debate, and sharpen our thinking about the ideas that shape a healthier world. Thank you for joining us for today's event. Thank you too to the many who make these conversations happen. In particular, thank you to the Dean's Office and the Marketing and Communications teams, without whose efforts these conversations would not take place. There are more than 220 million migrants living in countries where they were not born worldwide. If migrants were a country, they would be the world's fifth largest country. Looking at the US, over 40 million people living in the US were not born here. I happen to be one of them. There are more immigrants in this country than in any other country. Each year, over 1 million more immigrants arrive in the US. And the issue of the migration has long been a political flashpoint in this country, as it has been in many other countries. The US is a country that on the one hand has welcomed migrants, and on the other hand has gone through periods of demonizing and excluding migrants. And often lost in this political jockeying is the human element of the migration discussion. When we talk about migrants, we are fundamentally talking about people, not political abstraction. With our new book, Migration and Health, co-edited with Drs. Catherine Edmund and Mohammed Zaman, it has been a privilege to work with colleagues with a goal towards refocusing the conversation on the people and communities affected by migration. Today, we are joined by some of these colleagues who contributed to this book for a discussion about how we can best support the health of the people at the heart of this issue, the migrants and their communities in both their home and host countries. I am delighted that moderating this event is Migration and Health co-editor, Dr. Mohammed Zaman. Dr. Zaman is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor of biomedical engineering and global health at Boston University. He also serves as director of Boston University's Center on Forced Displacement. In addition to five books and over 130 peer-reviewed research articles, Dr. Zaman has written extensively on innovation, refugee and global health in newspapers around the world. His newspaper columns have appeared in over 30 countries and been translated into eight languages. He has won numerous awards for his teaching and research, most recent being a Guggenheim Fellowship for his work on antibiotic resistance in refugee camps. On a personal note, it was really a privilege working with Dr. Zaman and Dr. Edman on this book, and I very much look forward to hearing from Dr. Zaman today, as well as from all our speakers. Mohammed, welcome. Over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Dean Galea, for the introduction, for the wonderful opportunity to work with you and, and learn from you, as well as many of our co-authors who are today here today. Um, um, as Professor, as Dean Galea mentioned, my name is Mohammed Zaman. I also happen to be somebody who was born outside this country. Um, I also grew up in Pakistan at a time when there were millions of Afghan refugees in the country. That situation hasn't changed um, in about 40 years. In many ways, the xenophobia, the, polit the politics of exclusion, and the lack of attention to health has only become worse. As the director of the Center on Force Displacement, Boston University, our goal is to bring scholars, practitioners, researchers, activists, authors, writers, and the general public in addressing these challenges in a way that is ethically grounded, rigorously supported, and based on evidence. So it is my absolute and distinct pleasure to be here today and to <clears throat> be moderating today's discussion. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers for the program and also just give you a sense on how the program will move forward. First, we will hear from Santino Severoni. Dr. Severoni is the, is the director of the Global Health and Migration Program, Office of the Deputy Director General at the WHO in Geneva. He has over 24 years of experience as an international senior technical advisor and executive, having worked for WHO, governments, NGOs, and foundations in East Africa, Balkans, Central Asia, and Europe. Second, we will turn to Marie Nordam. Dr. Nordam is a professor with special responsibilities in the section of health services research at the University of Copenhagen, Department of Public Health. Professor, professor Nordam's scientific main interests lie within the field of equity in health, migration in health, and health services research. A particular focus is on the impact of ethnicity and migration on health conditions and access to healthcare, vulnerable migrants group, mental health, and chronic diseases among migrants. Third, we will hear from Aisha Kadir. Dr. Kadir, Dr. Kadir is a pediatrician and senior human, humanitarian health advisor for Save the Children. She works in the clinical care, public health research, health policy, and advocacy. Dr. Kadir's clinical work is in pediatric emergency medicines and social pediatrics in Europe and in humanitarian settings. The research, advocacy, and policy work focuses on the effects of migration, armed conflict, and other forms of violence on children and families and in finding effective ways to protect and promote children's and families' health, well-being, and rights. 
Fourth, Joshua Breslau will present. Dr. Breslau is a senior behavioral and social scientist at the RAND Corporation, whose work focuses on social and cultural influence of psychiatric disorders and their treatment. An anthropologist and epidemiologist with, two, with over two decades of research experience, Dr. Breslau's research examines racial and ethnic disparities in risk for psychiatric disorders and treatment use, life course consequences of psychiatric disorders and impacts of policy and treatment of people with behavioral health conditions. Finally, we will close the presentation with Dr. Sana Lu. Dr. Lu is a professor in the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. She holds secondary appointments in psychiatry and global health at the School of Medicine and Social Work at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western. Dr. Liu has been serving as Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health since its inception, and prior to joining the faculty at CWRU, she practiced immigration law for, 15, for 14 years, focusing primarily on deportation, defense, and health-related immigration. Once all of our speakers have finished their presentations, we will begin our panel Q&A discussion. I would like to ask our audience to please submit your questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom, and I will ask our panelists to wait until our discussion to those to answer those questions. Dr. Severoni, over to you. Thank you, Professor Zaman. Thank you, Dean Galea, for uh, having me with you today and uh, for the pleasure and privilege to contribute to the book. We firmly believe in, I firmly believe in that um, our work is supposed to be even more targeting uh, undergraduate or um, senior uh, students uh, into PhD or, or postgraduate type of training uh, to better understand the public health issues related to migration. And this is not only for public health students, but also for experts. We believe that also uh, those healthcare workers involved into clinical work sooner supposed to have a, a bit of a more um, background and knowledge on, the, on this important and complex topic. Uh, today, I put together a few uh, slides to just share with you the uh, recent findings we uh, collected from the uh, first world report on the health of refugees and migrants. Uh, the findings observed have been um, somehow uh, confirming our um, feeling that progress says are ongoing, but more need to be done in terms of uh, uh, really um, strengthening the capacity of the uh, health systems of our member states to respond to the public health needs of this population. Uh, if you look at the magnitude of the phenomenon, um, indeed, we cannot uh, um, underestimate the importance that um, the challenge faced by the population, we're talking about a billion of people on the move nowadays, if we uh, count the international migrants, internal migrants, displaced refugees. So certainly the public health challenges and the health outcomes that can interest this, this population uh, must to be an important uh, element of consideration for planning and uh, uh, service shaping by the health system. The report um, also uh, showed that progresses are ongoing, but more need to be done. We are just probably at the beginning of uh, seeing a, a more modern, more uh, attentive inclusion of this population in the effort of the health sector. Um, so far, the most uh, common attitude of the health sector around the world was to consider the health implication of population movement as a sort of side effect of the migratory process. It is not the case. Health should be considered as a uh, founding element to ensure health and well-being of all population, including those on the move. And it was interesting, the uh, confirmation and uh, the, uh, let's say, discover that the World Report showed to us the necessity to continue to work in addressing the root causes beyond the public health challenges faced by uh, this population. The need to really urgently reorient existing health systems uh, with an integrated approach, with a multi-sectoral approach, with a people-centered approach, with a primary care, a universal health coverage consideration. 
not uh, showing uh, tiredness to keep advocating and investing into uh, education and public education. Um, the necessity also to invest more into uh, research, quality research, particularly at country level in order to better understand the phenomenon and the manifestation on the ground, but also in uh, uh, starting to systematically collect data, disaggregate data, and uh, uh, using those evidence, those data for uh, policy formulation to support health authorities in, uh, taking, uh, in taking decisions. In order to uh, accelerate or in order to support those uh, needs identified by the report and by other research we, we have been conducting, the uh, global program on health and migration here at WHO invested into uh, five strategic direction or main area of engagement. The, we call them core functions because we believe those to be essential area of engagement if we want to see progresses. The first uh, core functions, which we believe extremely important is really investing into global leadership, high level advocacy, coordination and policy development. This is extremely important and as uh, today, uh, we are just uh, uh, the day after of uh, an historical happening. The executive board um, just 40 hour, uh, 48 hours ago uh, approved the extension of the WHO Global Action Plan on promoting the health of refugees and migrants. This is very important because it's been supporting, inspiring and guiding the work of WHO and member states this is the second uh, term, let's say we had the first five years of implementation, we conducted a review of uh, uh, progresses ongoing at country level, and it's quite encouraging, quite overwhelming to see that the number of countries better understanding and uh, deploying resources and, and uh, commitment in this area of work are on the rise. Uh, we also um, publish, in fact, a, a compendium of country practices. We receive so far, this is a living document, we receive so far 94 contributions from all around the world, where we extrapolated 48 cases, really confirming that major changes are ongoing. Um, although uh, the progress at country level need to, uh, this may, might sound as a, as a surprise, but need to be accompanied by changes and uh, adaptation, resilience of, of, of us, of our organization, of WHO. Uh, as I said before, this topic was uh, in the past um, touched upon in the frame of other cross-cutting issues, but never really supported in a systematic manner. Today, uh, the global program is uh, proud to, to work with uh, other uh, six teams in each uh, region of WHO. And, uh, the results are visible because things are developing as we speak with a regional policy in place and, uh, and a commitment in support to the member states. The um, second area of engagement that is extremely important, although it was surprising to see that so little was done in the past also by uh, WHO, was to invest into a core function of the organization, norms, standards, production, and research. In reality, very little was available. So we engage into a quite important uh, process of recasting the existing knowledge and norms in order to take into account the complexity and the uh, specificity presented by the uh, population on the move and the intersection with the uh, functioning and the service available in the health sector. But also we feel important to invest into um, a modern, updated, and effective research. The research agenda, uh, as I'm speaking, is ongoing, and we are planning to complete this piece of work by the uh, summer time and to publish in, uh, at the falls. And um, uh, the research agenda aim is to really provide a framework to uh, academic institution and to extend collaboration with academic institution with a particular attention to north-south collaboration. Uh, so far, we are observing that majority of uh, research ongoing worldwide is about reality in a low and uh, middle income settings conducted by academic institution in high income setting. We want to um, change this trend 
by involving more and more also academic institution in low and middle income setting and pairing them with a academic institution very well known and capable in high income set. The healthcare, work, healthcare, work, healthcare workers are of course for us a central element of uh, uh, interest and support. That's why uh, also recently we released the global competency standards and at the moment are under implementation process in a number of countries because this was a caveat existing in managing the healthcare workforce worldwide. And uh, this is essential uh, to uh, really support and shape up the uh, future healthcare workers able to deal with a complex uh, reality of migration and with a changing uh, demographic, which is nowadays interesting all countries. For a phenomenon which too often was wrongly perceived as an invasion or as an unmanageable uh, phenomenon. Reality, this is uh, something which is accompanying our life, which need to be managed in a wise, proactive and organized manner. The uh, third area where we are investing is uh, monitoring trends, strengthening health information system, and uh, developing framework to measure our progress as our impact at country level. This is extremely important. As I say, when I started my work in uh, WHO, the availability of data, uh, the availability of uh, um, evidence to support any sort of uh, technical speculation in order to also advise member states was extremely poor, was extremely insufficient. So this is, a, uh, this is going to be a central part of our effort for the uh, coming few years. And the report, which I mentioned at the opening of my intervention, is the first report of this kind, and we are planning to periodically issue a report more and more based on, uh, uh, on uh, data, on uh, fresh data that is going to be uh, analyzed and uh, uh, utilized to provide as much as possible a, re a real a reality picture of the situation. The current report was having the, the challenge that's been produced through support of uh, really a large team of collaborator, academic institutions, UN agencies and expert and consultant, but usually uh, analyzing, based only analyzing the existing evidence. So this was posing quite important challenge in terms of comparing the results in having a, a full picture, complete picture of the, of the reality. But however, very useful to draw a baseline picture and to identify the most urgent area of interventions as I showed you a few minutes ago. The next area, the fourth area of engagement is country support. We do believe that uh, what we do, uh, where we are investing energy and work, if it's not useful at the country level, it's useless. So the collaboration, support, and work with countries is really central in our uh, daily activity. We have um, uh, taught a number of initiatives. We have put in place a number of uh, uh, technical assistance plans. Uh, there is a massive production of uh, guidance uh, uh, and uh, um, technical uh, documents to uh, support the uh, member states, also training or uh, in-country activities to really move on the agenda on health and migration. But I like to mention uh, one, uh, a flagship of our, of our effort, which is the Global School on Health and Migration. The last one, uh, last December, was conducted in Bangladesh, previously in uh, Jordan. We tend to rotate in different regions. So this is becoming a very important appointment where the academic world, where the expert, where the government representative usually uh, policy maker, decision maker, manager. So the important part of the government, which is hands-on in uh, shaping up the uh, services and the health systems response to the health needs of migrants and refugees, uh, they're usually attending. So far, we have trained more than 5,000 people uh, through the uh, global, global school. Um, the last uh, area, uh, it's represented by the uh, engagement with partners. As everybody can easily understand, health is only one small piece of the uh, topic of migration. However, health is heavily influenced by what other sectors are implementing. And uh, that's why for us it's extremely important 
to have a close collaboration with uh, uh, key partners as uh, the International Organization for Migration and uh, UNHCR. We are having not only regular collaboration, but also WHO uh, is actively uh, involved and engaged into the UN network established by the Secretary General to support the implementation of the uh, global uh, compact on migration, why uh, my colleagues from the emergency department, they are fully engaged in working with UNCR uh, in support of the implementation of the global compact of refugees due to the prevalent nature of uh, preparedness and emergency situation around this group of population. Um, I'm stopping here and uh, happy to have share a bit of uh, how our work, but just to give a, a census of the um, engagement and priority that we are devoting to this area of work and looking forward to uh, questions or uh, requests of clarifications later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. <clears throat> Zavaroni. Um, really appreciate the perspective and also the programs. Uh, I think they are of great interest, uh, especially the, the schools that you mentioned. Um, and, and sort of developing a global um, scope and understanding of these issues. Thank you so much. Next, <clears throat> we turn to Dr. Marie Nordem. So over to you, Dr. Nordem. Thank you, and thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting today and also for inviting us to contribute to the chapter. I'm going to talk briefly about migrants' access to healthcare, which reflects the chapter that we have also contributed to. and. Um, uh, the next slide, please. So access to healthcare for migrants is central throughout the migra migration process and is also challenged throughout the migration process. So right from the um, beginning in countries or areas of origin where conflict, collapse of healthcare systems, lack of access to medicine um, affects migrants. And also during the journey, of course, the same uh, factors with lack of access to, to care, to medicine, um, to food, water, etc., may affect uh, care and health. And then these factors may also spill over uh, together with the factors in the uh, immigration countries uh, that I will talk more about uh, that affects migrants' access to health care. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about access to healthcare for migrants, we generally use two conceptual uh, frameworks. So one is to talk about equity in health. And uh, equity in health, as uh, stated by Whitehead, um, implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential, and more pragmatically, that none should be disadvantaged from achieving this potential if it can be avoided. And to obtain equity in health, we sometimes have to treat people uh, differently. So it can be in case of migrants to provide special services for some groups, or it could also be in case of other population groups. So that's one framework that we often uh, use. Another framework is a human rights-based framework where we have different declaration and conventions stating access to healthcare and to medicine for all uh, individuals. And we also have more specific conventions alluding to children, to labor migrants, to refugee groups, etc. And as, uh, as former UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson stated, so the right to health does not, of course, imply the right to be healthy, but it does require governments and public authorities to put in place policies and action plans which will lead to available and accessible health care for the entire population. Thank you. Next slide. And just to say, when we more when we talk about barriers in access to healthcare, we sometimes talk about talk about formal and informal barriers, but we can also talk about legal barriers, or they're quite identical to formal barriers, or and about uh, structural barriers and individual barriers. And I'll just touch upon uh, these different types of uh, barriers. So. Um, so talking about legal barriers, they especially um, allude to um, groups like asylum seekers and undocumented migrants who are limited in their legal rights to health care. 
Um, this study is a couple of years old from the European Journal of Public Health, which studied access or healthcare entitlements for child migrants in Europe and Australia. And looking more specifically at asylum seeking children, uh, the table here shows that only five uh, of the countries studied, uh, so to speak, gave um, uh, same legal entitlements to asylum seeking children as to native uh, born children. So we do indeed see some uh, discrepancies here. Next slide, please. Um, then uh, there are also structural barriers, and of course, they are more related to the organization of healthcare services. So it could be user payment or as recently introduced in Denmark, for instance, also as part of user payment, a fee on using interpreters if you've lived more than three years in the country. It can also be more structural races and more discrimination in the healthcare system, lack of interpreters and indeed qualified interpreters, it can be lack of, uh, of special uh, services like rehabilitation services, um, and also, um, it can, it can concern healthcare professionals' attitudes to uh, patients with migrant background. The last uh, kind of barriers I want to mention is individual barriers. So they are, of course, related to the individual migrant and, so to speak, concern what, what we all carry of uh, luggage and characteristics with us. So it can be language barriers. It can be newness, so how do you navigate a system when you're, when you're not uh, used to how it, it's structured, you're not used to maybe the, the role of the health care professionals and how they act compared to what you have previously experienced. It can be health, lack of health, uh, literacy, so awareness of, um, uh, of diseases and bodily functions, etc. Illiteracy, marginalization can be uh, um, vulnerable financial situations, and also kind of the general stress of living transnational lives that may um, affect how you access care also. Next slide, please. Um, I think there's one, another one. The next, yeah, thank you. So to overcome these different barriers and to promote, promote um, access to healthcare for migrants, I think it's really important that we have migrant-friendly health care policies, of course, and also that we know that some um, immigration policies that are not health-related may indirectly also affect migrants' health. Um, then it's also signing of international conventions that need to be reflected in national law, which is really important, of course, especially for the vulnerable uh, groups that I also mentioned before, like children, asylum seekers, and of course, when we talk about these issues, it is really, as, as, um, as was just mentioned before, it's really important that we, uh, that we have strong agencies like WHO in the, in the field uh, heading many of these efforts because it's uh, united efforts of, um, of uh, researchers, policymakers, um, uh, NGOs, et cetera, to try to promote um, equity and access to healthcare for migrants. Um, another thing is improving the organization of healthcare services, including having separate services. It's uh, debated sometimes, but it's also a way of empowering some groups. And it's necessary, for instance, a rehabilitation for torture and trauma survivor services, uh, et cetera. As was mentioned before, also, um, Improving data collection is really important that we have data actually throughout uh, the migration process, also um, data from uh, countries of origin when possible and um, during the journey. And that we also collect data as far as possible on the more difficult populations to collect data on, like undocumented um, children or undocumented migrants. Um, and lastly, I think another uh, important uh, area where we can help um, promote access to healthcare and equity in health for migrants is, of course, to roll out diversity competences to a much larger degree, uh, organizational-wise, but also for our clinicians uh, in the clinical work. Uh, you can give me the next slide. Thank you. 
And here on a final note, I just want to say that the, I think the concept of diversity competences has been used to a much larger um, extent in the, in the US than in Europe, in many new immigration countries like the Nordic in Europe, where I come from, it's, it's rather a new uh, concept, so to speak. But it's really important that we teach our medical students, nurses, healthcare professionals, people in the healthcare system, um, uh, about uh, how to uh, work with more and more diverse populations. And of course, very often it's mentioned here that it's a three-legged concept. It's a concept that requires knowledge about risk factors, disease patterns, et cetera. It requires knowledge about attitudes, being able as healthcare professionals to reflect about your own implicit bias, your tendency or all of us have our tendencies to stereotype, et cetera, but that we are able to reflect about this is a first step about privileges, power structures, et cetera. And then skills is the last leg, which is, for instance, being able to, in the clinical work, to uh, cooperate and know the framework for working with an interpreter, among other things. So that was actually all I wanted to uh, give of a brief introduction. Uh, to migrants access to healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the perspective, including sort of the access as well as the perspective that you bring in from Nordic countries. Really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Aisha Kader, and I hope I'm pronouncing her uh, noun and name correctly, um, is uh, our next speaker. Over to you. Unmuting here. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, especially thank you for ensuring that the discussion will uh, include a focus on children. Um, so what I would like to use this time to do um, is really to discuss why we should be paying attention to the health needs and the risks of children who are in migration situations and also why we should engage with children to better understand um, what they're experiencing and what the priorities are. Children are more likely than adults to be, um, to be affected by, to be forcibly displaced from their home. They account for 41% of forcibly displaced people, but they're only 30% of the world's population. And the vast majority are living within their own country or a neighboring country most of them are in low and middle income settings and many are fragile, conflict affected or vulnerable settings. And among, you know, more generally among uh, migrants who've crossed an international border, one in eight are children. Migrating and displaced children have specific health needs and health risks, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, but a couple of particularly vulnerable and also less visible groups that are important to mention include unaccompanied children um, and children whose parents are have migrated. So unaccompanied and separated children are either traveling alone or they've become separated from their caregivers or families. And we only have estimates for the number who've been registered with authorities at some point. This number is 153,000, but it's really thought to be a significant underestimate because of low reporting rates and because many of the kids don't ever come into contact with authorities to register their, their presence. Um, another particularly vulnerable group are children who have one or both parents that have migrated somewhere else. So these children may be left in the care of a single parent or a family member or a friend or a neighbor. And they're more likely to face barriers and access to their basic needs and especially to education and to health care. Um, and as with other children in migration situations, we really, we really don't have sight of them. Um, probably least one of the least uh, visible groups of kids. Most of the figures come from China and India, but the phenomenon is well known across the globe, um, very broad, broad. And I think many people in this uh, webinar may may either know people who at some point have been left in the care of, uh, of somebody else while one or both parents have, have moved or maybe have been so themselves. Before we talk about what we know about the health of migrant children and the risks, 
it's really important to be clear who we're talking about. And I make a point of this because it really is a challenge. Um, I have a on the slide here, I've got a definition from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that a child is everyone, every human being below the age of 18 years, unless the law in the given country says otherwise. So it, it's actually up to individual nations to define who is a child, and it's very focused on chronology, the chronological age. And then depending on what lens we look at, um, like for example, you know, in adolescence now is, is most commonly defined as 10 to 19. If you're looking at violence against children, you'll see another grouping. Um, there, there are many different ways to define a child. However, I mean, so why is this important? Well, if you wanna understand what kinds of health risks and health needs that migrant children have, it's really important to think about what childhood is. And so we can see the human being and whatever needs and vulnerabilities they may have, as well as the protective factors. So if we're gonna promote child health then, and to protect ch children, then we really have to be able to see them and also to hear, to listen to them. Um, I think everyone agrees now that a person's health early in life has measurable impacts later on. And so we've seen a shift globally towards a life course approach to health and to public health. But for children, this is especially important because they go through some pretty extraordinary transitions in a very short period of time. And I'd like to um, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to consider the differences between a newborn child, a 15-month-old, a six-year-old, and a 15-year-old. They're really very different. And not only their physical size, but also what they can do and how mobile they are and how they communicate. And they go through some quite significant changes in the way their bodies function, and they have a profound process of cognitive, social, and emotional development. And all of these factors play a role in how they understand themselves and also the world and how they engage with their surroundings. And, and all this time, while their bodies and their minds are developing, their identity is also developing and changing. And their identity, their understanding of themselves is determined by their health, of course, but also um, their understanding of themselves impacts their health. Uh, so it's a quite a circular sort of a, a, a bi-directional process. And the way the world, the way people and the environments uh, engage with children is very different when they're at different stages of growth and development. And this doesn't always correspond to their chronological age. And so when children move place, this introduces another form of transition that influences all the other continually changing and developing aspects of their lives um, and also their bodies and also their identities. Life is upended and the environment changes. Everything is new and foreign and they may become separated from their caregivers, their family. Um, they may not understand the language. They may witness some of the worst of humanity and hopefully also some of the best. And I think uh, Professor Naradam touched on quite a few of the barriers that, that children are particularly vulnerable to. Um, the key thing to remember is that whatever age or developmental stage, children are actively participating in their lives. They have thoughts and understandings about what they see and what they experience. And the way they make sense of the world influences how they behave, how they interact with it. And that impacts what kinds of health and safety risks they may face going forward. So the health risks are related to the conditions before they move and during the journey and after arrival, but how they understand everything that's happened and how they've experienced that has really important effects on their health and their needs and their health risks and their well-being. So we have to see them and we also have to listen to them to understand. Um, and we have to try to understand what they've experienced and how they make sense of it. If, uh, because if we do this, then we have a, a much better chance of meaningfully protecting them and promoting their health. So this last slide is very much an oversimplification, um, seeing as how there are so many different phases um, that children go through. But the point it intends to make is that most, the most common and the most important health needs of children at any stage of the journey are the most common ones are social in origin. And so access to basic needs and a safe and secure environment, participation in school or daycare, and support for caregivers to optimize caregiver health and well being are some of the most important factors. It goes without saying that access to appropriate and informed pediatric health care is, 
is important as well. Um, but community acceptance, especially, um, and a sense of stability have been shown in numerous studies to be protective. And studies in Scandinavia have found that children and young people who perceive discrimination have significantly worse long-term health outcomes compared with migrant children who felt that they were accepted by their community. So when a supportive social and educational environment uh, is in place, then children have the best chance of adapting and adapting positively to whatever they've experienced and, and to their new environment. On the other hand, if we don't put these social sort of protective factors in place, then children are at high risk of injury, physical and psychological illness, worsening of any existing health conditions they may have, as well as trafficking, exploitation, and death. And so I'd like to conclude by bringing our attention back to the continuous transitions throughout childhood and adolescence and the importance of children's perceptions and understandings of, uh, of their health risks and of their and of their behaviors and their health outcomes. Children account for a large proportion of migrants and refugees, and they are among the most vulnerable. Um, but if we engage with them, and if we provide appropriate support, then we have the opportunity to nurture healthy and positive life trajectories, not only for, for the children who have migrated themselves, but also for future generations. And that, I will stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kader, uh, for, for the wonderful presentation and emphasis on children uh, that are often uh, most vulnerable and um, in many cases not considered with the same level of rigor engagement in our scholarship, in our practice um, as they ought to be. Um, we now move on to Dr. Breslau, um, who is from Rand Corporation. So over to you, Dr. Breslau. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great pleasure to be included in this uh, presentation and an honor to be presenting to you today and to have been included um, uh, with my co-author Lillian Perez in contributing to really a landmark volume on migration and health. Um, I'm going to focus my comments today in this uh, brief presentation on the area of my own empirical research, which is really focused on labor migration and mental health. Um, and in particular, I really have kind of one overarching uh, theme or point to, to emphasize, which is the importance of a transnational focus in this research um, and the importance of seeing migration not simply as the movement of one population to another area, but as a really a, a complex of uh, institutions and, and movements of, of people and resources, um, culture, et cetera, um, that connects and ties populations across uh, international boundaries, um, as well as um, across large distances, even within countries. Um, so there are a lot of migrants, as has been as has been said, labor migration in 2019, according to IOM, uh, there were 169 million international migrant workers. Um, labor migration, I think it's important to distinguish uh, the labor migration from refugee movements. Um, in the case of labor migration, we are not often seeing the same kind of acute crisis situations. But that's not to say that really the public health impacts are small. The public health impacts, given the enormous numbers of people um, who are impacted um, and the, the ramifications that these have across the broader populations in both the countries of origin and the countries of destination, are really, um, are really profound. And I think we um, are still um, trying to grasp what those, what those might be. Um, my work focuses on uh, mental disorders and the epidemiology of mental disorders and migration, and I'm here I'm going to be very broad um, and talk about uh, broad, you know, mental disorders broadly, including substance use disorders, um, and um, the, which we know mental, disor mental disorders are um, among the highest sources of disability-adjusted life years globally. Um, 
it's important that when we think about mental disorders, we're really thinking about chronic mental medical conditions um, that they tend to begin in childhood and adolescence. So they uh, interact in different ways uh, with migration, depending on uh, where in the life course a person is migrating or where they are impacted by migration. Um, and that there's a very high variability across countries from what we what we know and, and think uh, in terms of the prevalence of, of conditions. And often we have um, migrant groups crossing boundaries, crossing into populations that have a very different um, underlying rates of mental disorders. Um, so the work that um, I uh, referenced so that I was talking about is largely part of this study, um, the Mexico-U.S. Migration and Mental Health Study, which was a collaboration um, with um, between researchers, researchers in the U.S. and researchers in Mexico, um, and it really um, took advantage of a serendipitous opportunity where surveys were conducted in Mexico and in the United States using the same survey instrument at the same time and had information on migration history in both countries um, and allowed us to combine um, data on these two countries and look um, at uh, migration in a, in a transnational setting. So prior research really had just been, had research data in the United States and had looked at, uh, for instance, migrants in comparison to people who were born in the United States. But we were able to look at, um, at, both, at both sides and, um, as, and I think really see some um, processes and aspects of this overall transnational phenomenon of migration that otherwise were, were invisible. And, and, um, and this is an example, <laughs> or several examples, I should say. So I realize this is a busy slide, and that's kind of the point, um, because each of these that I want to emphasize are kind of different aspects of this transnational process of migration that is likely to, that are likely to have uh, impacts on um, on mental health, and actually we have shown have impacts on mental health, um, and all of them really require. Uh, some kind of transnational or cross-national data to investigate. Um, and so uh, we have a, a health the issue, whole issue around health selection. Um, so how do migrants differ from non-migrants um, in their mental health status before they migrate? So there we need to have information on who's migrated and the country and information on the, the source population. We're of course interested in the impact of migration on migrants. So among migrant individuals in the the after they have in the period after they have migrated um, as a as a period of risk, um, and we're interested there also in um, it. What turns out to be really critical in Mexico U.S. case, also in behavior change, um, uh, and in particular related to substance use and risk for substance use disorders. Um, there is um, the, the impact of migration on families of, or in origin countries, as was mentioned um, earlier, Re return migration. So migration is almost never, I should probably just say, is never just about one direction. Um, it is always in, in people return, um, having been changed or altered by the experience of migration. And in in our case, the really the experience of uh, coming to the United States from Mexico, of developing uh, you know, patterns of drinking alcohol, using drugs, smoking, um, and then going back to, uh, to Mexico and bringing those um, behaviors along and the associated risk for, uh, for subsequent disorders um, and um, as well as other health implications. And um, the issue that we uh, really started with in terms of settlement in a destination country, uh, cross-generational impacts, um, and there's a huge amount of research, of course, on enculturation to risk factors in the set in the um, destination country, marginalization, ethnic stratification within um, countries. And I think this is a partial list of the various um, processes 
that really we need to, to have a better understanding of um, in order to understand really what we is just a probably a dizzying array of migration uh, migrations around the world that is only becoming more complicated. Um, my last slide, just thinking about implications, um, and I think uh, Dr. Severino hit on some of these, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, to see that, that uh, complementing what uh, um, he has already said, um, I think given the, the transnational issues, coordination of prevention and services in an origin and destri destination country seems to be is, is a huge priority. Um, there is a great need for, uh, for research um, coordinating surveys across countries, mixed method studies, which is actually the topic of the chapter that we wrote for this uh, book, um, and um, and has been mentioned, the need to address multiple barriers to treatment for mental health conditions in destination countries. And I think there needs to be a special focus on mental health, um, where I think the barriers are larger and different than they are for general health care. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Breslau. Um, really um, interesting work, uh, including policy implications as well as uh, methodolo methodological ideas there. Um, I also want to thank all the speakers so far who have done a phenomenal job in keeping time, and I really appreciate that. Um, last uh, but not least, Dr. Sanalu. Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this um, conference and also for um, authoring a chapter in the volume. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be here and to um, speak with you. So I'm going to be speaking on sort of at the more micro level, looking at a case study of the United States in terms of policy access and outcomes. And this will reflect some of the themes that you've heard in the earlier presentations. So in the United States at the current time, there are 44,800,000 foreign born individuals in the United States. And this accounts for approximately 13.7% of the population. Of these individuals, um, 20.8 million individuals are not citizens and 23, approximately 23.9 million are naturalized citizens. But their access to healthcare and their ability to receive healthcare is quite different. Um, what we know, for instance, is that um, among children with immigrant parents, um, even one immigrant parent, they are twice as likely as children with two, two citizen parents to, be, to lack any kind of health insurance. We also know that 33% of non-citizens have no usual source of care compared to 20% of citizens. That 32% of non-citizens have not had a doctor's visit in at least 12 months compared to 20% of citizens, and that individuals who are not citizens, of those 10% have gone without needed medical care in the previous 12 months compared to 7% of citizens. So how does this come about? This comes about from our overarching policy that has really been integrated into legal features of the US system. So the overarching policy is to protect the public health, reduce healthcare costs and taxpayer burden, and to promote self-sufficiency. The attempt to protect the public health through the exclusion of individuals who are deemed to have specific disorders or carry specific diseases has been a, a feature of US immigration law since at least the 1920s, if not even before that. The effort to reduce costs and promote self-sufficiency is more recent. And what it has done has been to limit access to publicly funded sources of care. And although some provisions existed earlier, they have become increasingly um, rigid. So in terms of limiting eligibility, 
um, Medicaid has severe limitations except for the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, um, which allows emergency medical care for medical emergencies and for patients who are in active labor. That actually sounds more generous than it is as medical emergencies are defined relatively narrow, narrowly in the law compared to what you or I might envision as a medical emergency. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, um, also known as Ob Obamacare, um, has limited the ability of non-immigrants to access the exchanges and to buy insurance. Between the promulgation of these laws, um, there were other statutes that have been enacted, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1986, and the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, which expanded the um, application of public charge provisions and limited the ability of individuals to immigrate absent an, an enforceable affidavit of support from individuals in the United States. There are some accepted groups to these provisions, um, victims of severe labor or sex trafficking. Um, this requires application for a T visa. Um, individuals who are victims of crime, who are either assisting or willing to assist um, prosecutorial um, entities in establishing the criminal offense, a U visa and abused non-citizen family members under the um, Violence Against Women Act. Asylum recipients are also accepted. This does not apply to asylum applicants, which means that individuals who are in the country and their asylum applications are pending are not able to access these sources of care. So what are the outcomes? Um, you heard from Dr. Breslau about the particular um, impact on mental health. What we know are that immigrants are much less likely than US born citizens to use medications for mental illness. And part of this has to do with the accessibility and the cost. We also know from a variety of studies that detained individuals, even those who have been diagnosed prior to their detention for mental illness are often denied treatment and are held in conditions that have exacerbated uh, their mental illnesses. And unfortunately, there are potential immigration consequences for individuals who are seeking care. So individuals may find that they are barred from regularizing their immigration status as a result of having obtained certain forms of assistance for their mental health. So unfortunately, there is a complex patchwork of laws that are designed to exclude individuals from the country um, who may have particular diseases or disorders. Um, and this leads to a decreased met access to medical services and increased adverse health effects. These laws really form a patchwork because they are found in the immigration laws, they are found in the welfare laws, they are found in state laws as well. So that even though states are permitted to provide funding for care for immigrants who would not otherwise be entitled to do so, a minority of states have, make, have made that available. And so ultimately it's unclear whether the policy purposes of these laws are actually doing what they are supposed to do and whether they are protecting both the taxpayer and the immigrant. And I will conclude here. Thank you. Thank you everyone for um, a wonderful, wonderful um, set of presentations and um, staying on time, uh, sharing your insights, both from what is in the chapter and in many cases, how it has evolved uh, since uh, you submitted the chapter uh, several months ago. So um, with that, I wanted to sort of uh, reach out to the Q&A section and uh, um, sort of uh, ask our, um, sort of attendees if they could type their questions. Um, so what we were going to do uh, was to sort of just read the, the questions um, as they appear and um, try to answer them live. Some of these may be um, sort of uh, similar in nature. So we will, be, we will be cognizant of that and not try to do that. And I, I would ask anybody from the panelists to raise their hand 
and, and respond as they see fit. The first question is from Madhavi. Um, and Madhavi says, for health to be considered as a right, do we not need to transform our global economic parameters first? The focus of economic growth allows for externalities related to poor health, due to poor, to the poor and the vulnerable. It appears that economic literacy on how decisions are made in the first place are the first step to implementing changes. Perhaps this is why the process is slow. Any thoughts on uh, connecting the economic aspects and the global economic drivers that lead to migration and hence health has a consequence of that? Um, anybody who wants to sort of comment on that? Uh, Dr. Severoni, please go ahead. Well, happy to share a few uh, considerations. I fully agree. The economic dimension is uh, probably the most important driver for population movement. The majority of this large number being mentioned during the different presentations are economic migrants. So people tend to move mostly for searching for a better life, better living conditions. Uh, the issue is that still we have to admit the uh, negative rhetoric about uh, the effect of uh, migration to the receiving country tend to prevail and uh, somehow uh, hampering the political discussion to really include migration as a resource, as an opportunity into the economic debate. Uh, I think we should really do uh, the best to link up, for example, the discussion about managing migration at the G20, G7, the uh, Davos Forum, and all these major uh, economic uh, concerns. The other uh, element for which there is no progress, uh, despite the, 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 the challenges and the reality is in many cases well known, is the fact that the tendency of all member states, all countries to deal with migration tend to be individual, country by country. The, um, availability to set up a partnership, a regional cooperation, a regional uh, engagement is not yet there. And uh, mostly uh, because the, the topic remains very complex and very dangerous for politicians in charge. So they tend to uh, touch upon few symptoms, but not to address in the, the root causes. I'd like to conclude by uh, replying to the uh, person that raised the question uh, in terms of uh, cultural development, if I can say like that, it's very interesting to uh, listen to the uh, last speech to the nation of Roland Reagan. Ronald Reagan was a conservative and uh, uh, my sound uh, contradiction to say today, well, conservative, they have a solution for migration. Well, listen to that uh, last speech to the nation and the content of Ronald Reagan or the way how Ronald Reagan picturing the migration phenomenon in relation to the United States, maybe today can be compared to a speech of the Secretary General of the United Nations. So something happened politically in the last 30 years where only the negative dimension, only the toxic narrative has been uh, proliferating and, and not really uh, pay attention of the uh, benefit of uh, migration uh, phenomenon, including the economic return, not only for the country receiving, because migrants are working and producing wealth, but also the remittance system, uh, system producing development at home and so on. Thank you very much. There are several questions and I'm going to combine them on climate change um, and the impact of climate change on migration. Um, some are directed to WHO, but, but there's another one as well at the bottom um, talking about climate change in general. I, I don't want to ask a specific question here because I think there are multiple dimensions, but would love to hear from uh, speakers about the impact climate is having on migration. And also in my own area uh, of research, some communities are unable to migrate because of climate change. They're sort of locked in because they can't go anywhere, right? Uh, stateless communities in Pakistan and elsewhere. Um, uh, so there's an element of immobility as well that is connected. So, so thoughts um, um, on, on climate change, its impact, and how do we think about the health dimensions of that? I'm happy to jump in. 
Um, yeah, and so climate change is a major, and extreme weather events are major drivers of forced migration. And so and I think uh, some of my colleagues can speak to other aspects of it, but in, in thinking about child health and well-being, um, it's, it's both an impact, it's impacting um, people like forcing children and their families to move, but it's also actually impacting what kinds of illnesses they are more prone to. For example, um, Professor Zaman just mentioned Pakistan and in Pakistan with the recent floods, which did displace a huge proportion of the population of Sindh, um, it also predisposed them to things like cholera and waterborne diseases. Um, also, when they end up uh, being forcibly displaced, especially in the acute phase, uh, what happens is they're often overcrowded um, in inadequate Basically, for children, there's, they're they're shuffled. Everything is turned upside down. Also, whether or not they're with their family, they have a huge host of safety risks because people are living often quite close to each other, um, and a lot of different things are happening. People are just trying to survive, and what they're doing to to make make sure that everybody has a, a shelter over their head and has hopefully something to eat. What ends up happening is um, children can again be basically start to disappear after the earthquake in uh, in Haiti. This was well known that there was there were organizations or people actually going and, and trafficking children, finding children who'd been separated and trafficking them and then putting them up for adoption in other countries. There, so there are so many different risks that are social risks and again, health risks that are related to the extreme weather events or drought, like what we're seeing in the Horn of Africa um, right now. Um, that, and it also impacts conflict. And so climate change, can both uh, worsen the effects of conflict and it can, so the, the two of them can sort of synergistically force migration and can force also the places that people go to and the conditions they're living in. Um, and for children, again, this is an added compound um, a series of risks for their health and their safety, which impacts their current state of health and also all the risks in their health in their later years both in their childhood as well as in their adulthood. Thank you. Um, Dr. Severoni and then uh, Dr. Breslau. Yeah, happy to compliment because there was a specific reference to, to WHO. I want to clarify that, no, we, we don't distinguish support to a population by topic or by context. Uh, emergency are emergency. So uh, as we are uh, raising the concern about possible, because at this stage we are talking about simulations and possible scenarios in terms of uh, size of uh, population might be put on the move because of climate changes. The reality is to deal also with the existing emergencies. And at the moment, the number of emergencies generating displacement are really too many. Uh, and we are actively engaged in all, in all of them. Uh, the issue of um, climate changes uh, is that uh, probably uh, not so much going on in terms of preparedness. So helping the health system to uh, be resilient, reactive, uh, if large movement of population will start. But also, in my view, is a topic that deserves a bit more research to really help the health sector to position and to understand how to play an impactful role in managing the phenomenon when will manifest or when will be the, um, pressing the uh, border of uh, countries which might be interested. The last element related to climate changes, and in my view, uh, we are too silent on this topic, is that uh, when we are dealing with a migration, with management of refugees, unfortunately, definition matters. And uh, when we are um, addressing the needs of refugees, thanks to God, in many cases, we are comforted by the fact that many member states, many countries have been adopting the Convention on Refugees. So they have a national law in place to protect these people. This is not the case for migrants. So probably considering the scenario that we might be facing in the coming decades, it is time to engage academic institutions, policymakers, politicians, maybe to revise the Convention for Protection of Refugees, to extend 
the protection to certain population. As I'm speaking, just come to my mind the example of Karibati, uh, uh, Karibaki, where the islands is thinking, planning to move uh, ensemble all the population to a new territory. They actually already uh, purchase a new territory in a nearby island because possibly their country will disappear in the coming year. So how this population can be protected in, the, in this context? What kind of uh, uh, commitment, what kind of uh, mobilization of the internal community is available in order to uh, step in supporting those populations beside the humanitarian response, beside the charity, beside the uh, compassion that might be put in place on the specific issue? Thank you. Dr. Breslau? Yeah, I think I'm saying the same thing, which is that uh, the climate uh, my, migration is really kind of combines some of the elements of refugee movements and labor migration and does constitute kind of uh, a gray area that, that we need to kind of think about definitions. Um, but um, also, it really forces us to think beyond the, the acute situations and to the predictable and predictability of movements of, of people as a result of climate change and and the ability to and really the you know the need to um to develop solutions um proactively before crises occur great thank you so much um, i'm going to change track a little bit there are several questions that i'm going to combine about mental health in the context of United States, but I think it goes beyond that as well. Um, can um, one of you comment on what are some of the challenges that are faced by migrants, new immigrants, refugees in the context of mental health and what is available and where are the gaps and how do we address that? So uh, Sana, please go ahead. Yeah, in terms of the availability, a part of it is going to depend on the status with which somebody enters. Um, if someone is entering as, a, as an asylum seeker and they are awarded asylum or they're entering as a refugee, there are actually significant resources available uh, very often through community mental health centers, through refugee resettlement organizations, uh, through what, what would be called nonprofits or non-governmental organizations. Um, for people who are entering without legal status, it's significantly more difficult. Um, I can tell you that going back uh, four decades ago, it was difficult but not impossible to find private practitioners who would donate their services um, to work with individuals who are undocumented, for instance, who had mental health concerns. Um, and that probably extended for several decades, but at least for two decades now, it has become increasingly difficult with the shifts that we've seen in the medical care system, um, the, the um, requirements that physicians see so many patients within an hour that they account for all of their time, um, the in integration of smaller practices into larger hospital systems. So for individuals who are undocumented, for individuals who are trying to regularize their status but who do not yet have legal status, it is increasingly difficult. There is always the fear, for instance, that if individuals access care through the public sector, um, even if they are entitled to that care, um, even if they have a US citizen child and that child needs mental health care and they are awaiting their own immigration um, regularization, um, that they will refrain from getting that care because they're afraid of the public charge implications. And public charge implications, what, what that means is that when someone tries to change their status or um, enter the country, they can be excluded or denied a change of status because they have relied on these public funds for care. Um, so for that segment of the population, it's, it's quite difficult. For individuals who have been detained by immigration, there is increasing research demonstrating that um, there is inadequate mental health care within those facilities. It varies across the detention facilities, but in general, it is inadequate and very often exacerbates their condition. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question that is specific to Aisha. Um... Dr. Kader, um, 
Thank you for your brief and insightful presentation. As discussed, more equitable and accessible healthcare systems are critical to improving the health and well being of migrant children. Also, supporting their successful integration into their new communities are needed. What efforts or examples do you see on this aspect? So thank you for this question. This is, um, and I think this is, this would be relevant also for the caregivers um, as well. There are, depending on where you look, you can see um, different countries will have different responses. Like in Sweden, um, there is, there, in 2015 and 2016, they received a very large number of unaccompanied minors, but also just a large number of people coming into the country um, from a, a few different regions of the globe. And, um, the the actual and i'm going to speak specifically to children um the actual uh response by the government they kind of switched into a, a humanitarian response and i i say this working in humanitarian health at save the children this is kind of what we dream of is that that we're not necessary and that the government is able to sort of take try and take charge and and respond that's not always possible when the system is overwhelmed however what they have done is they've actually developed and, and really rolled out across the nation um, a program to help uh, families specifically. They initially started focusing on labor, on trying to get the adults into the labor market, and they realized, hang on a minute, the, the well-being of the, the basically the, the family, the caregivers, are actually really dependent on the rest of the family, especially the children. And so if we look at children and caregiver mental health, then we can actually really promote really positive uh, integration. And they've set up um, a kind of, uh, they're called them health communicators, but they're actually sort of people that are sort of buddies. Their job is to help people to understand what life is like in Sweden, um, to where they can go and access uh, their basic needs, their, also what their rights are in Sweden, um, and then making sure kids are, uh, basically they, they, parts of it are making sure kids are able to access school and follow how they're doing in school. And if there is trouble then to help sort of put the various structures that are in place to support them. This isn't possible everywhere. And Sweden is, um, is a quite well-resourced country. Most of the migrant children across the globe are living, as I said, in fragile settings and low and middle income countries and often internally displaced in their own nation. And there you will see also exam beautiful examples of communities that actually kind of rally together and welcome um, set, they, they bring supplies. We also saw this again in, in Greece, I think is a, a high profile example, but you see this across the globe where, where communities will actually sort of have compassion basically and welcome, um, recognize that people are coming, that they need their basic needs and they, they'll actually try and, and reach out. And once you start to establish those connections and people meet people, um, that's kind of where for lack of a better word, kind of where the magic can happen because once you see the humanity of a person in front of you, it's really difficult to, to kind of put them in that other box. Now they're a human that's in, in your sphere of experience and it, it's, it's, um, it's more compelling to, to help them and to, to make things easier for them. Um, other things that can be done are, uh, you know, whether it's through a government or an NGO, basically setting up, making sure they have access to school, even just, you know, in, after, so another example, displaced people because of climate change. Um, often what we'll do is we'll actually set up, as NGOs, we'll set up, uh, say the children will set up what we call child-friendly and also girl-friendly spaces or spaces where um, children can, it's meant to be places where kids can just kind of step away from all the, the difficulties they've been experiencing and, and try to be kids. So you do various activities, but you also have people around who can kind of see, are there any risks? You have people who are trained to understand, are there any children that are particularly vulnerable and any risks or any health needs? And you can get them plugged into that. But you also, again, they'll have, um, you know, be working with people from the, the communities and hoping to get them sort of engaged with it to, to get people to meet each other. Cause that's really at the end of the day, um, the last but not most important thing is that governments and media really need to, the rhetoric and the tone of the rhetoric and the way migrants are, are um, characterized in the press is, has a huge impact on how people see who's coming um, to, to their neighborhood. And that really impacts whether or not they're, how they're welcomed, I should say, not whether or not they're welcome, but how they're welcomed um, or not. 
So there, there are many different things that you can go from a from a national level to or or, or an you know a external agency an international NGO like Save the Children or many others, um, but also communities themselves. And I think some of the most successful and really beautiful examples are actually when communities just rally around, yeah. um, and that that's also more the long lasting. I think a more sustainable way to help support integration and, and really a sense of acceptance, which is very protective for children and for their caregivers and families. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Dr. Nordam? Yeah, I just want to uh, add actually to this about mental health and children, some areas of concern that we have uh, recently dealt with also in recent in uh, research uh, from Denmark. And one has been one focus area, I think, here is. Um, is sort of that children are sometimes double burdened by uh, intergenerational trauma also. So by being in many ways, having experienced trauma themselves uh, and also experiencing the, that the, their parents living with their parents. So I think that's a focus area where we should, that we should not forget. And we know that from uh, studies that it has an secondary trauma has an added effect on experiences of trauma. I think another important uh, point is also that at least being a healthcare professional, I'm, I'm also working as a clinician. You often have children as these uh, shadows or silent witnesses that are helpers in the healthcare systems, translators, uh, helping their parents to and fro, et cetera. But that, that is also burdensome and we should take care of these children that we see on a daily basis in the healthcare systems. And then I also want to add as a third thing that these children are also very much affected, as Dr. Severoni said, about this discourse that has just been societal discourse that has been toxic. And we know from research that it affects their self-images and actually they think worse about themselves and the outcomes in their residence areas for youth than is actually the case, the factual case, but the self-images are affected by the media's. And at the same time, this youth, I think, is an incredible, important uh, group for us as researchers and as clinicians, uh, not as clinicians, but as researchers to work with and as health policy makers to bridge to, uh, to the parent generation and, um, and to, to collaborate with. So that's just what I want to say in this context. Great. Uh, I'll take one last question. I'm, I'm cognizant of time. There's lots of really good questions. But one thing that hasn't been mentioned often is IDPs. A lot of the conversation has focused on refugees and people coming to a different country, the local, the, uh, the role of local communities. And I wanted to sort of just bring that to the fore and ask if uh, uh, any of our panelists, and again, we're, we're somewhat short in time, about four minutes left before I give it back to Dean Galea, on what can we do despite the complex um, politics of nation states and state sovereignty um, and the fact that there are uh, tens of millions of IDPs in need of that. So I'll start with you, Dr. Gather. Uh, yeah, so this is something that um, I think the key thing is to recognize when, um, when countries, like rather than have a bunch of external actors try and sort of wait and want to jump in, the key is to be aware. There's two things. One is to under, we need to be able to see children and migrants more generally. So we have to have better understanding of where they are, um, which is very difficult actually, uh, when you think following people who are, especially if they're moving or they're continually moving. Um, but if we know they're there and then we can actually work together with governments to, to support them. So governments, you know, usually again in the humanitarian sector, um, so often IDPs can be in, they can be in camp settings um, or they can be in informal sort of settings or they can actually be in the community in, in private residence. Um, so they, they're they difficult to, they'll be in different places and the way in any different, in, like in a given context, the, the kinds of needs and risks they have will depend very much on what is happening um, specifically in that area. And I think the key is to actually work with governments to be able to see if you recognize as a problem as an external sort of group or agency or organization, then to actually go to the authorities and, and mention this and, and maybe can offer support, but the government then should be the one leading it. Um, and that's the key. If you have, if you can support rather than under, the last thing you want to do is undermine the existing infrastructure and systems. It's really, it's really trying to package bits of support in the, the most appropriate places. Uh, and that should really be driven by governments. 
Thank you. Great. We'll take uh, Dr. Lou's comment and then I'll hand back it to Dean Galea. I, I have somewhat of a disagreement with that because um, one of my concerns is with internally displaced persons who are displaced as the result of genocide. And in those cases, I don't think it is appropriate to necessarily uh, rely on existing infrastructures because those infrastructures may in fact be responsible for the genocide. And despite the international conventions, um, perhaps we need to relook at those on a more global level um, to see what our global responsibilities are where we see this happening. And certainly there are countries that have closed their doors um, to individuals who are currently internally displaced attempting to leave their countries as a result of genocide. Great, well, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for um, just a rich discussion. Uh, it can go on for perhaps not just many hours, but many weeks and months, really sort of um, unpacking these issues and, and learning from each other. I also want to thank our um, attendees who have contributed many questions. And I have to uh, apologize that I can only take a fraction of those. That, that, that richness um, is both exciting, but also embarrassing uh, of how difficult it is to really um, navigate all these questions that are coming from our colleagues. But again, a big, big thanks and over to you, Dean Galea. Well, I, I simply want to echo what uh, Professor Zaman said. I, I thought it was um, just a, a wonderful conversation. It's a rich conversation with content and also a tremendously engaged audience with really interesting questions. You know, I've um, had the privilege of working with all the speakers on uh, the book and I uh, learned from you today as much as I've learned from you and uh, your work on the book. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody for uh, for uh, being a part of this and most importantly thank you for what you do every day and uh, thank you for Sir Zaman for sharing and to everybody for joining us everybody have a good evening and good afternoon take good care